I'm Michael Case and um, work with Kira Consulting and we were going to be talking about Boost Dash. You, um, you might be confused and want to call it Boost Ache. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, that's wrong. It is Boostash. Boost Dash. Um, there have been recommendations on how to maybe spell it differently in order to help. We've got this, but um, Ray was pointing out that this might give people trouble at night and not be able to sleep because <laughs> it's not closed. But you know, this actually, this is actually kind of cool because the stash part is replaceable in Boost Stash, uh, nice. which also makes you want to maybe make double handlebars. But that's just getting carried away. We had another suggestion from somebody in the back row. Um, or towards the back that we call it Caterpillar. And I'm not sure why, but we're not going with Caterpillar. Is that okay, Thomas? All right. So if you don't want Caterpillar and you want a different name than Boostash, you might have to submit something. So this started as a Library in a Week um, project, as I think most of you know by now, last year's Library in the Week. And um, I like to use the word challenge. It seems like each year the Library in the Week somehow has something very challenging about it, um, w w whether it is understanding what uh, Jeff's looking for for, like, <laughs> this was the slide that was put up to introduce it, C++ template engine, and I'm kind of like, I mean, isn't that what the compiler does already for me? I don't know what more we need. So um, I was like, what? I don't know what that is. But um, it is a text template processing engine, and um, if you don't know what that is, it's, it takes documents in, it takes data in, it applies the two, and it gets a new product out, a new document out. Um, and there'll be plenty of examples here in a moment that we can see why we might want one of these or why we might want to use one of these. <coughs> Here's some examples of existing template uh, engines. Uh, must, mustache, which we've based this design off of somewhat, or at least the input format initially. Handlebars, C template, Dust, Django, Jade. Um, there are a variety of different ones. How many people here, just so I have an idea, at least, how many have used a template engine or know what one is to some degree at least? Right, so most people, that's good. All right, great. <clears throat> so the original cast for Library in the Week um, were these folk, as well as a, a couple other people who want to remain nameless. I don't know if that's just like, I don't want to be associated with the project <laughs> at all, or, um, or what not, but um, it, was a, it was a fun group to work with, and I, I just want to put a plug in for Library in the Week at the moment. Um, if you're not already doing it, you need to do it next year for sure. Library in the Week is by far probably my favorite part of the entire conference. I'm still recovering from last year's Library in the Week, which is why I didn't join this year's yeah. yet. But next year, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what it'll be. We'll talk more about that later, probably. Um, so one of the things about Library in the Week and how Jeff had set up the repositories is we've got all of the notes there. And it was a lot of fun reading. In fact, we'll see some more fun later on. But it was fun reading what it was that we were trying to build. Um, so the things we were looking for, uh, we wanted it to integrate well with the um, standard template library. That's nice, right? That'd be good. Um, some type safety, not entirely sure what that meant, but have some ideas. Uh, template parsing errors, uh, provide customization of markup language, make configuration of this thing simple, and then we'd like to be able to take any data structure that's convertible to text should work with this thing. Um, feature, compiled templates, not Entirely sure what we were aiming for with compiled templates, you know, as it was getting thrown out as, as the list, what that means, but we compile our templates, so I guess we work. We have something called compile, so that's good. Um, and then uh, the design decision was to use C11. One, one of the other things that came out during the design discussions as we were on our first day was that we would like the data model um, to. to fit one of these two models, and primarily the second. So the first being, as you, as you have your template that you read in, you're going to take data and apply it. What does that data look like? Does it have to be JSON? Is it some type of format or model that's already preconceived and has to work a certain way? Hash to strings, I mean, hash of strings to strings. What, what does it look like? Um, well, I mean, that's interesting, but not super interesting to me. In fact, not interesting at all, really. Uh, except a user-defined model. That's really interesting. And so th this project is something that when Jeff started describing what it was, I got pretty interested in and pretty excited about. Partially because uh, this is the type of thing that our company does all the time, but we usually have to do it with somebody else's spec and, and um, 
and work in somebody else's guidelines. And so here, being able to have a little more freedom and work with a bunch of people um, and to come up with something new, lots of fun. Um, and so here, here are some examples of what mustache is. So mustache ended up being what fell out as the, the, the way to go with what the initial template language should look like. Um, so we have a template. Hello, some name. You've just won some um, value of dollars. And if you're in California, you're going to get taxed a lot for it. But if not, um, we're just going to print these, these first things. The data coming in, the name is going to be, it's this um, JSON-ish looking example is what they're going to give for us. Um, we have a name of Chris, some value. They're going to calculate the taxed value. And there's a Boolean if in California. Uh, and so the double, the double brackets represent replacement of whatever's inside of the data model. Um, this is what they call a section. And so you can think of it as like an, an if statement. If this evaluates to true, we're going to go ahead and look at what's inside the body. Um, and uh, Chris won some money. Here's another example. Uh, same type of thing where we have a section, but um, notice the data this time. <coughs> it is actually a list of more object type definitions. And so when it's used this way in mustache, what ends up happening is this becomes a loop. It's going to iterate over all of the values inside of the, the array, and um, we're going to get out the results for all three in this case. So um, the, the behavior um, that's described up here is actually related to what the data looks like when it sees the data. Sometimes it evaluates to true or false or it's a Boolean result and it just enters in and does something with it. Um, but if in that evaluation it has something that it could iterate, it then goes ahead and iterates over it. Um, it iterates, it happens to iterate over lists only in mustache. It does not iterate over objects. Some of the other template languages allow you to iterate actually over the object members. Um, and so uh, here's our example then of what this might look like. So how would we use this in Boostash? Um, so Boostash, we're going to go ahead and, and just use a string for our, our template at the moment. My name is name, I'm age so many years. And um, let's go ahead and just give it a map of string to strings. Yes? Yeah, so it's, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, thank you. <laughs> the question is, does the hashtag have two different meanings? It has a meaning of what's, what they call a section. And a section has a definition that says it will evaluate um, to true, and false, true or false. And if it, after it evaluates to true or false, also the data represents a list, it will then iterate the list. Um, and so that it's kind of a, it has an odd meaning, right? It's, it's an overloaded, um, weird operator. Well, I guess if your array here, repo, was empty, right, then again you would get nothing, right? Because an empty array, there's nothing to iterate. Right. Exactly. Or, or I would assume even, or if repo was not defined in your data. Or if repo was not defined in your data, you would have nothing. That's right. That's right. Isn't that implied by the data structure already? Since it's an array, so it knows that it's an array, so it'll iterate. Yes, um, that ends up uh, how the definition works, right? Okay. So we have to deal with that when we get it into into C++. So, you know, I think trivial to think about how to do this in a dynamic language like JavaScript or Python or something like that. Um, and now we've got to we got to start thinking about how we want to deal with this problem, um, in particular the data model side. Um, when, uh, when we're in something that's a strongly typed language. Uh, most people in this room, other than Joel, have to think hard about how to do that. Joel, it's just like, bam, because that's what Joel does all the time. Come on, no. <laughs> really, man? <laughs> Mr. Fusion. Um, all right. So um, we're just going to make a map. Our data model to start off with is just going to be a string to string hash, right? Nice and simple. And um, so now I have my input described, some data described, and there are two phases to utilizing Boostash. The first phase is this, in which you load the template. 
And you say load template, you provide the, the, um, the front end that you want to use for loading. You give it the, um, the template that's being loaded. And what's actually returned is a compiled template. So you have a compiled result that's returned. Yep. Um, is there a reason that the, the first iterator has to be an L value? No. OK, so you could have said begin and there. Yeah, so the question is, is there a reason that the first, first has to be an L value? And uh, there is not a reason. I remember when I did spirit yeah. stuff a while ago, there, was, there were cases like that where you had to actually Put begin into a variable. Phrase parse is uh, right. takes the first parameter as an L value. So you'll you want to uh, know where the iterator ends up okay. after the parse. So Spirit cares about it, but Boostash does not. Okay. So um, now now is a good time to mention this. Uh, if I had to write code and like display it to a whole bunch of people at a conference as you know, reputable as mm, like a BoostCon or C++ now, it would not be this code that I'm showing today, okay? <laughs> so, um, and in, in saying that, um, this is definitely a work in progress. Uh, there, there are, as you see things, there's gonna be everything from just like, how come sometimes uses trailing underscores in variable names, sometimes they're not. Um, so there's a lot of unification, there are a lot of people working on the project, there's a lot of unifications going on just to make things better. Um, there's like, some of the stuff like uses move semantics correctly, some of it doesn't even realize that move exists, you know. Um, so we're gonna see a lot of that today. Good questions? <laughs> Feel free to ask them so that I can remember when I go back and look at the tape later, right? <laughs> so once you have a compiled template thing, it, it's no longer front-end specific. It's agnostic to what the front-end was. You've got this template thing you can go around and you can utilize. Um, and the call for the second half of the phase is called generate, where you pass the stream that you want to generate into, you pass the template, and then the data that you want to have applied. So this is the usage of Boostash. Um, so one of the things that interests me a lot, um, I know it interests Joel and some of the other people that Kira a lot, are interface designs and how we use libraries. Um, we, we get sometimes a little bit overly passionate about it, in fact. And um, yeah, what? <laughs> um, and, and so we're constantly trying to strive for how will a user uh, interact with the library? We don't worry about what's on the back end. Because the whole goal is to present something that was easy for the user to use. And um, so if, if when we get done with the presentation you say, it was hard to use, please let me know. <laughs> and we're going to figure out how to make it easy to use. Um, but this is it. All right, so let's take a look at another example. We have um, an input where we're looking for lines. And in theory here, then this lines will be actually a list of things that we're going to print out for like an invoice. Um, so we wouldn't want just a thing to be a Boolean because that would be kind of meaningless. Um, and so for right now, let's go ahead and just create another map of string versus string, uh, which is what we're going to call our item. We'll have a vector of these things and they're going to have a map of these vectors of hashes. So we have at the end of the day a map of string to vector, and the vector contains a map of string to string. Okay, and we're, we're just gonna fill that up right here. So um, this is, makes us all happy that we deal with <laughs> C++ 11. <laughs> and, um, and we're gonna create two um, objects or maps of items that are in this list, and then stick it then inside of um, another one here um, and so I've built up, in essence, a very <coughs> ugly looking AST using some structures, but you know, there I've got it. And um, I can go ahead and then, once again, the same little dance. This is how I use it. I just throw it at it. Okay, and this is just going to work as is. All right, um, let's do something else now. Let's go ahead and have an invoice. Um, it's a little more complicated. It's got an invoice number, a company. Um, if a company exists, we're going to want to display its name and where it is located, and then the lines that are in the invoice. And uh, the input, we're going to go ahead and use an extended variant. So, just 
briefly describe what an extended variant is. It, think of a variant, which is kind of a pain to use because it is a type def when you go to use it usually, and um, you want an object so that you could forward declare things to make recursion easy. Right? The problem with the recursive variant is that you don't have something that you can talk about yet because you need to know what it is before you can finish closing it out. So um, extended variants in spirit, it's something we use a lot. Um, I know I've talked to some other people at the conference even this week who have their own variations and you know, roll this on their own. So you can treat variants like they're objects. So it looks just like a variant, but now we can say things like a variant of an object, which is a string to a value t, so we can reference itself. So this is a recursive variant. Um, so this thing, when it's done, can hold either a string or a map of string to itself type or a vector of um, itself type. So we can hold lists of it or maps of it. Does that make sense? All right. So now we can write something like this. Um, we now have an invoice number and a company we can describe by saying that the, the company has an object that has the, um, the key value pairs. Um, lines, which is then going to be an array of these things, these objects, and that kind of meets what we're looking for. And um, same little dance. We just go ahead and we take this and we throw it at it and it just works. Okay, so um, what I hope you see at this point so far is that uh, we don't have a data model that it's looking for. Um, we have a pretty flexible front end. You don't know about that yet. You're going to find about that in a moment. But um, w the usage here has been the same, and we've been able to create some things and uh, assemble them together. And my guess is, um, at least the people in this room will break it. But you know, your average user probably can make some data structures and um, you know recursive data structures, put them together, and throw it at, and it'll just work. Um, all right, so let's talk about. Um, all right, let's talk about this. So uh, I'm going to print out first name and last name. Um, we're going to congratulations on the acceptance of the library to boost. I, I had printed out here. Now you get a month off or something like that, but I guess not. Um, <laughs> and. And, uh, you know, same little dance down here. We're going to get a template. We're going to apply it to Sue. What, what is Sue, do you think? Okay, potentially. Some kind of structure. Yeah, how about this? How about if instead it's actually an author struct that happens to have strings because, well, they're strings, but they could be other things too. And I'd really like to do this, right? Because this is probably more like what I have inside of my system. I probably have like real structures of real things. Uh, so now, how am I going to make this work? Is it Fusion Adapt Struct? Yeah. Fusion Adapt Struct. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to Fusion Adapt Struct this thing. And I only need to Adapt Struct whatever's used actually in the template, those fields only. Um, so I, I'm not adapting email because I actually didn't use email. And this now will work and, um, and I can just apply it like, like I did before. I just set Sue in. So um, the other thing I can have in addition to uh, STL container types and combinations of those and variants as we've seen, we can have other things like optionals and, um, you know, your standard types that you build up ASTs with. We can also have user-defined types if they have been fusion adapted or tuples. Um, okay, we'll talk more about that too. How do you refer to fields in the tuples? By number, but I, what's the syntax? Just like this? Repeat. I don't, okay, thank you. <coughs> My sign person, no. Uh, the, uh, the question is, how do I refer to um, fields in the tuple. Oh, in the tuple. Sorry, I thought. Yeah. 
So uh, the tuple has to either be indexes, or if they're arrays, if you're talking about um, a container type in which you're trying to iterate over something, it'll just iterate obviously over, over the tuple type. Right. So you'd say something so, like yeah. So it's actually, it gets weird, um, and it's weird in the sense that there's not a um, canonical way to represent something like that in mustache. There happens to be a canonical way to represent that in like Django templates. Um, which is interfacing to Python in the back end. So, um, but that, it's not written yet. Okay. But there's somebody who's working on it. He's not here, so he must be working on it right now. <laughs> uh, for the fusion adapter, is it just the case that it, the, it just finds it? You don't have to give it to the template engine? It just magically gets discovered in the compilation? It has to be... The question is, is, do you have to give it to Mustache or to Boustache? Do you have, what do you have to do with this fusion adapted thing for it to understand it? The, the fusion adapted thing has to be visible um, to, um, to the call at this point, the generate call. So um, if it's adapted, what we typically do is we adapt them inside of a header file. Um, and you'll see that in a moment, what the code organization looks like for the ASTs. You just include that before you call generate and it just works. All right, um, last example and then we're gonna like do some stuff. Uh, so we could have this, which is more complicated. These are still boring, they're strings, but we have an invoice now, which is more probably closely related to something we might really have. Um, that has an int and an invoice number, a company, which is another type, and a vector of lines, which are these lines here, and as long as these are all fusion adapted um, structs, then it will know what to do with it when it sees it. Can you nest those types like a menu? Can you, question is, can you nest the types like a menu? Absolutely. It's just recur recursive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and here, here are adapted structs for that. So same normal thing for adapting. Yes? So are those uh, sub are the, are the names nested in the namespace? Then? Yeah, so that, it's a good question. Those are the bonus slides. If we get to them, I'll show how we actually do the fusion bit and walk the fusion. So fusion, um, boost fusion adapt struct actually has a public interface that's inside of the, the docs, which um, embarrassingly Joel had to show me two days ago um, because I usually just look at the preprocessor output and then write the meta program that goes with that. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's actually defined and uh, there's a way to extract the name. Um, the name gets, one of the things that gets stored inside there along with the place of where it is. And so as it's adapted to a tuple, you know actually a, how to pull a reference out and you know how to, um, all the different things that you need, right? as well as its name, you can extract that. So if you write the meta program that looks like what you need, you can then extract out for the string comparison of which field you're trying to get to. Um, yeah, okay. So l let me show, here's example number five. We had this thing and that we just talked about. What if though my input was not um, stash, which is the, what we're using for mustache, but what if the format was Django? This is what you do. You say it's Django instead. My front end is a Django front end. All right, so let's dive into this because that's what we probably really care about. We'll see how far we can get. <coughs> so this is the top level view. And I think once, once you kind of get an idea of what we're doing, then you, the first phase of it is you say, wow, that was like overly complicated. Why'd you do that? And then hopefully as we get through this a little bit, you'll see it's actually not that complicated to write front ends. Front ends are really easy to write. Um, the challenge, in fact, I, I, Yorun said this week, I don't know about that. And I challenged him to write the Django one, and he wrote the Django one. Um, like in a couple hours, he had the parser and most of the bits of the compiler working, and the whole thing kind of just glued together in about, I think it was probably about three hours total. And the whole thing doesn't completely work, but there's a Django um, branch in there right now that, that looks pretty good and, and does most of the stuff it needs to. So um, I, I think that was my proof of concept, and I probably owe him pizza or something. The, the load template that we saw here, load template and generate, remember those are our two phases. This is basically load template. 
it's taking the template that you give it and it's going to create this compiled template as an output. The other part, the generate, is this engine part that we'll talk about um, as the second phase portion. So the first phase portion um, has a front end and a back end, and then we've got an engine in which we're going to take the compiled template and apply that, and the user data and apply that and get our generated result out. So let's talk about the front. <coughs> so the idea is the front is going to take the template input uh, there's a front-end parser associated. It's going to create an AST that represents that thing that it parsed in. The compiler is going to do nothing more than trans, um, th then take the, the front-end AST and uh, translate that into whatever the engine's AST needs to look like. So the engine has an AST that it will use. <coughs> so let's dive down a little bit. Load template. So load template, we have um, we have a stream version of this and we have a, an iterator version of it. And it looks like, hmm, so I lied. Don't it's tell, <laughs> don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Nothing, we'll fix that. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> All right, so load template is going to do this thing where it, it calls back end compile on the front end parse specialized on format, giving it the begin and the end. Um, yeah. Just one, you know, suggestion on the API. We really just ought to put a string version right. so you don't have to pass iterators. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the, que the, the recommendation is that we should have string versions so you don't pass, have to pass iterators. Or maybe we have yes. Ranges. And maybe a range version. And so we actually, we already have a volunteer who's writing the string one right now, and it looks like um, Jeff is ge getting ready to write the range one. So I think we're set. We'll have those checked in with a pull request real soon. Um, okay, so I'm going to dwell a little bit on this, and, um, and part of the reason I want to dwell on it for a moment is because, uh, in my mind, part of this talk is about, obviously, the internals of, of Boostash. Um, but part of the talk is really a lot about how we actually write software in Kira. And, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that because um, I, I think it's unique and we actually get hired by people to go teach them how to write software, so it must be somewhat unique. So um, interfaces are super important. And, and you, want to you want to give your user the best interface you possibly can. And there are lots of ways to do that, obviously. Um, and this is going to be one of the techniques. So remember, when we, when we did this load template, we told it the front end we wanted to use at this point right here. This gives us a ton of power if we're smart about it. We, we can put something, th this could be something here that's convenient and special and does neat things for us and allows us actually to make lots of changes in the back end later when we get smarter about how to solve problems without affecting the user. Right? That'd be really nice. User would like that. Um, and, and that's part of how we do this is it's this format here. And so front end parse is going to be specialized on the format. In this case, maybe stash. Um, and it's going to pass the beginning and end. And then we've got compile is just going to take whatever that result is. So what's inside this stash thing? Well, yes, question. Go back. Why don't you take a basic ice cream instead of an ice cream? Because um, it was probably hacked together at 3 in the morning. <laughs> what, the question is, why are we taking I, the ice cream that we're taking? There will be all kinds of things like that you'll find. <laughs> it just, the, the code really hasn't been vetted. Think of it as like proof of design. <laughs> um, so what is this stash thing? It, it's a struct. And at the moment, you can see the struct is actually super boring. Uh, it has in it um, three types that are defined for us so that we can utilize those later. And it's a nice place to, a placeholder that we can expand and add new ones later when we need them. Uh, it's a struct because we can um, as opposed to a namespace, so that we can have one of these things and pass it around and specialize on them. And by using a mechanism like this uh, in your interfaces to help specialize your interface, you, 
you create this barrier while you isolate your user from the internals of your library. And you're allowed to go and make changes all day long to your library by simply changing, in essence, things that you need in here and they don't care about. Because they're just going to pass this thing, that type name around. Um, all right, so for us, we're going to actually have the grammar defined in here and the AST. We defined the grammar and the AST separately. Uh, initially, when we started looking at this, we thought we could actually reuse the parse ASTs with um, a few of the different grammars because a lot of these template engines uh, look almost identical except they have small syntactical changes. Like I don't like double curlies for that, I like triple curlies for that, you know, things like that. And you're like, okay, there, there's like no change at all to the AST, which means that there's no change to the compiler, I just need to change the, the parse slightly. Um, and then same thing with skipping, we thought we could maybe reuse skippers. So skippers are defined in here too. Uh, so one of, the, one of the cool things that I pulled out of the notes, um, could use boost spirit for parsing or maybe regex is enough. And uh, I thought this was really funny because in 2010 I gave a talk on spirit in which this is like slide three or four on excuses we make for not writing a real parser when we need one. Um, and so I don't know, don't use regex, I think is the way to go. So we didn't. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> what does the parse look like? So parse looks like, um, takes the iterators, in this case we're looking at the, the iterator versions. Um, it, based upon the format that we had passed in earlier, we're going to go ahead and um, have an AST and a grammar, and we're going to call phrase parse, giving it the begin and end, the grammar, the skipper that we got out of that format thing that was passed in, give it the AST to fill up. If, um, so this is, you'll see this type of thing throughout. If there are errors or bad things or comments that say like, think of something smart to do. I took those out so they'd fit on the slide, but it says right above here, think of something smart to do other than probably returning an empty AST. But if the parse fails, it just returns an empty AST right now. This, this is one of those really embarrassing things, by the way, because the people who worked on the parser should know better and know how to return decent errors with line numbers. So um, I worked on the parser. <laughs> That's uh, bad. Okay, in, uh, before we dive in the rest of the way to the front end, um, I'm just gonna throw out tidbits every once in a while. Here's some tidbits. The front end uh, directory has front ends for each of the different types. In this particular case, we're looking at stash. It has these files. It has an AST, um, an AST adapted, a grammar, a grammar def, and a printer. Um, this is what the user cares about. And the user could just be like me internally. It's the definition of my structs. It, it's, what th it's the structs without any of the funky fusion stuff. I take the fusion stuff and I put it inside of an adapted file. It doesn't clutter up my life. I don't care about it. In fact, nobody cares about it except for the compiler. So I just need to include that when, when the compiler is ready to see it. But most users of the data, right, they just care about the nice plain version. Grammars, splitting grammars up. So grammar.hpp contains the declaration. Grammar underscore def contains the definition of the grammar itself. And um, <coughs> I want to throw this out there as a way to organize your code if you're using spirit, because the large compilation times can go away if you organize your code a little bit differently. At the end of the day, your code is going to use a certain instantiation of a spirit grammar. It's not going to use every possible instantiation of a spirit grammar, right? So instantiate one in a CPP file, and then don't make everybody else build it. You can forward declare it from that point on. So you don't have users complaining about build times anymore. They build it once, and then from that point on, they don't have to keep rebuilding it, rebuilding it, rebuilding it, rebuilding it. And so um, this is something that we do all the time. We have a grammar def that's really the definition of the grammar. Printer, write yourself a printer which takes the AST and just creates some output of what that AST is. So the testing, testing infrastructure now for this, um, the way it's set up now, is it, it uses a mechanism that we use um, in the company a lot where we will have a directory of files. 
input files and expect files. The input files get read in, the expect file gets read in compared against the printed result of the AST. If they're the same, life's good. If not, it creates an error. And you'll see we checked in a version um, that actually takes boost, t uses boost test. It dynamically creates a test for every file pair that's inside of the directory. So you end up with independent tests. So if you have a continuous integration system, you'll show that you ran 20 tests. You add a new file. Now you've ran 21 tests without compiling new code, right? Um, and so we've set up our system so we test the parser this way, we test post-compile, because that's the next place we have an AST this way, and we test from end to end, from the very beginning all the way to the end result um, this way. And so you'll see that set up, that's uh, right, right printers, they're good. So what does the parser look like? We're going to actually um, parse uh, zero to n of these stash nodes, um, which is a node list. Um, what is a stash node? Literal text, a comment, a variable, variable unescaped, a section or a partial. Literal text is, um, is everything that doesn't start with uh, the, the, um, the double bracket. A comment looks like this, starts with that, has an exclamation, and then everything till we get to the double. What is a variable? Starts with this. We're looking for one of these to match one of these. This is, this is a trick I'll just mention now. This matches is looking to see if it's got one of these, and if it does, um, it'll consume it, but it's going to return a Boolean. So we can set a Boolean flag of the type of variable it is, because mustache has this like, concept of whether things are escaped or not escaped. Um, I bring that up because in the end here, I'm going to talk about how, how to write grammars versus ASTs. Um, and then an identifier. What's an identifier? Well, an identifier basically is an alpha followed by zero or more alphanumerics or underscore characters. Um, and, uh, and we're not going to have a skipper while we're going. What is a section? Okay, a section, we're going to match against the double curlies and then the caret, because that is actually um, an inverted section versus a normal section. So it, it's like... The, um, the else instead of the then of your if statement. We have a section begin and then um, more of those nodes because it's whatever's contained inside there. We're going to create more of these and then the section end. Section begin looks like these double curlies, the pound or the caret, <coughs> um, the identifier, which then we actually take that identifier and we pass it into the end so that we can actually... Um, um, search for that in for the end of the section. What does the mod mean? What does the mod mean? It's section, Yeah, where, where do you, oh, here. Yeah. Um, it, okay, so, um, it is a, <laughs> so at this point right here, we have a semantic action um, with inside of spirit. So when this rule passes, runs successfully, this action will run. Um, and as soon as a semantic action exists, no longer do you have assignment of whatever this would, um, whatever this expression creates as far as like an AST, it no longer gets assigned to the result of the rule. And so percent equals uh, forces that to occur. And so whatever is synthesized by the rule set is, becomes what, um, what you can have on the left-hand side for the assignment. So, um, yeah. There you go. It's about default behavior when you introduce it. Yeah, it changes the default behavior when you introduce a, a semantic action. All right. So, so this is the grammar that describes it. And um, other than the matches, if you just kind of got rid of this matches stuff, right, ignore those for a moment, the grammar is pure. It just describes how to parse what we want. Um, and ignore the semantic act. Well, not that one. We need that one. <laughs> That's the only one. Um, so when you write grammars, you want to start small and you want to go big, right? You want to keep adding to your success. And you want to concentrate on the grammar, not on what you're producing. At least um, Joel and I at least have this theory. <laughs> 
let the AST naturally come about. Now you might go back later and look at your AST and make some realizations. Like, for example, um, there was this concept here of an inverted section or a normal section. Well, I can just look ahead to see what type I have and set a Boolean and then remember that later. Okay, that's almost like an optimization as you're trying to figure out your AST later. But it's not trying to fit your grammar results, what it's synthesizing, to fit your preconception of what the AST is going to look like. Um, instead, parse naturally into the, the AST that will just fall out of your grammar, and then use a phase in which you will um, translate that into another AST if you need to, or modify the AST in a second, in a second phase. That, that's far easier to do and maintain later than, than other things that you might. So the natural fallout of this is something that we have this uh, undefined something else. <laughs> so undefined, so variance rate will um, create with whatever the first thing is up there. So you want something lightweight. Well, we have plenty of lightweight things actually. But we also want to know very often that I have a default constructed variant as opposed to a variant that has become something that I care about. So nothing will ever assign undefined, but if I end up with a, a, one of these nodes that has been default created and now I've got it and I'm trying to use it, it's something we usually assert against. It's something we're worried about. How did this show up? Um, okay. So, all these things look pretty normal. You probably expect comments we don't care about. Um, here's another trick. So, um, usually people are cringing at this point. We inherit from string. We sometimes will do it from, for other things so that we have a type that is distinct. So, uh, the new variant proposal, my understanding last week, is that you can have three ints now inside of the variant. And you can refer to them as, you know, first, second, and third int. To, to me personally, that's not very interesting. The reason I'd have three ints inside of a, a variant is because they have some semantic difference. The reason I have three strings inside of this variant is because semantically they mean something different. And that's what I personally, that's what I want out. Okay, I don't, I don't care that there's three different and they're in three different places. I don't know how to deal with that yet. Um, I, I might after I read the paper or something, right? But at the moment, I don't know how to deal with that. So what, what we do is something like this, where now we have an identifier fire type, we have a literal text type, we have these different types. Um, all right. A, a show of hands, how many people know how to print a, a recursive variant? If you're to write a printer, okay. All right, <clears throat> so we'll go through this because we're going to talk about visitation of variants. And um, visitation of variants is basically how the whole thing works. So um, if you don't get that, then the rest of the talk is meaningless. We're going to print a node list. This is, this is our node list is a vector of these things. So I should be able to for um, uh, iterate over these and apply a visitor to whatever it is that I have. I, I don't know what's inside my variant, so I'm going to apply a visitor that can figure that out. And visitors are very simple. They're just a struct that has an overload for each of the type that's inside of the variant, right? There's nothing special or magical about them. And so we're going to go ahead and write then for, well, undefined type, comment, each of the types that we have. We'll go ahead and write the method for that. Um, and in this case, we're just printing things out. And we're printing things out that kind of, sort of, almost look like what we parsed in. There's some exceptions, but kind of like that. So now we have a printer. So we can bring our AST in and we can print our AST back, back out. All right. So we have this now, our front end AST. Um, the next step after this was to call compile. <clears throat> so um, compile is easy because we can just make overloads now for our AST types. <coughs> so the only thing that we care about is getting it parsed into an AST that makes sense. And then from that point on, uh, the front end, so to speak, the compile should be the same. If the AST is the same between these two different template types, then you know, it doesn't compile the same. Unless they have different semantics and you need to give it a new, 
you see, don't, don't use the same AST for different semantic, semantics. That'd be a really bad idea. Um, and so, uh, so we have a compile that takes this stash AST root. And, um, and we can call the stash compiler compile, uh, which does nothing more than uh, creates this visitor and begins to visit what it has. So what was it that we were going to do for, um, for compiling? What's the, what's the goal? Taking this AST and producing the internal, the engine AST, right? So we're just doing a transformation of one to the other. Um, okay, so, so our stash visitor has, this is where we entered into it. It's going to go ahead and iterate through the nodes. And um, VM AST node list, this is a node list for the internal AST type. So um, it is going to go ahead and push back the result of applying the visitor on the node that it has from, in this case, we'll say the stash AST. <coughs> So let's just take a second to look like what's inside the internal VM AST. So at the moment, this is what it understands. It understands an undefined, a literal, variable, render, for each, if then else, select context and node list. And we'll cover some of these. But this can give you an idea of, in essence, what are the commands that the VM understands? Because the VM is going to do nothing more than visit the tree and walk the tree to produce its results. Uh, not interesting. Literal. A for each at the moment has a name. It really should be called tag. Um, and it has inside of it the node or another set of these things that, that represent what you're for eaching over. Um, if then else would have a condition, a then, and an else. Select context has a tag and then it has a body of what we're going to do with that afterwards. A node list is then a vector of these nodes. So my, my, um, my visitor then, for undefined, I'm just going to create at the moment a, a node and just stick it in there, which creates another undefined node and throws it in. I'll, I'm just like pushing the problem down the line because I don't know what to do yet. <laughs> uh, literal text, well, I'm going to create a literal text and uh, return that. Variable. Um, it, it works out that variable is the same as render at the moment, but, but that's really just because we never really worked out the semantics when we started what we were working on, I think, of what these things mean. So um, we're going to create a render and pass in the value. When uh, a comment it works out to be an empty literal. Um, this Partial thing is actually not implemented yet. We did not implement partials yet. And um, so we're just going to return a literal at the moment. Let's take a look at the more complicated one, the section. So section was a little more complicated, right? It did something interesting. So what is a section going to do? So you remember a section uh, begins with this tag name inside of the section that's going to give us some logic that we've got to start with, some Boolean logic of some sort. Inside the section, then we're going to have a bunch of nodes, right? So more, more things that we've parsed in that we need to do something with. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take those things that are inside of the context of that and we're going to um, iterate over them and apply the visitor to those and push them back. So we're basically creating that internal node list of what are all these things that are inside of my loop or my block, my section, what are all those things? Um, and then I'm going to get a a for each type, I'm going to call that my section body. It has a name, which works out to be whatever the section came in, its name. And then the, the body of this, the value of this for each, um, is the transformation of all the nodes that were inside of the stash set. Now those have all been transformed, right? When I come out here, those have all been transformed into whatever my new internal set is. Um, so I, I add those, um, I assign those here to this value. All right, so that's nice. It could possibly be a for each that I have, but remember that's surrounded by first this if-then 
statement, if then else statement. And so I'm going to create an if then else block. And it's the way conditions work at the moment is it's just the name that it's going to be looking up and trying to figure out what to do with these things. So it's going to take the section name because that's the same thing as the condition name, right? It assigns that. Then um, select context, we'll talk about in a moment what, what that does, but remember when we had nested objects within objects within objects? Well, the behavior of when you have one of those versus you don't on the data side means you have to actually descend your stack, the stack already exists. You're basically extending this data stack or you're not going into the data stack. So we're, we need to select different contexts to be in, potentially. Um, and then we, we're gonna look to see, is the section inverted? If the section's inverted, then this gets assigned, all the stuff we've built up, gets assigned to the else portion. If it's not, then it gets assigned to the then portion of the if block. So if we're to look at this, we have an if block, and then inside of the if block, it has a then or an else, and what gets assigned to the then or the else is going to be um, the select. And what is the select of the body? Well, the body select is everything that was inside the section already transformed. So that's how the compiler works, right? And it does that for all the different types that you might think. So we're just doing this transformation. Um, it ends up, while, while sometimes this stuff looks like it's crazy or confusing, it ends up, I, at least I find, it's really refreshing to work in this paradigm because I'm only ever working with one thing at a time. I don't worry about everything else in the world. Here I'm only worried about what is a section. And I know I have a node of other things, but I don't care about what the other things are at all because I just dispatch those back to the visitor and then later on I go back and I work on whatever that visitor node is, right? So I'm always working in very small bits and pieces assembling these things together. Okay, well what if I have these two different front ends, right? So we've been talking about the stash compiler. What if there's a Django compiler? Well, same thing. It's this compiler is telling it how to get to the intermediate or the internal AST. Um, here's a Django version. And you can see it has some slightly different syntax. One thing it has is it has an if else block. So mustache doesn't actually have else. So you'd have to write the normal block section and then you have to write an inverted section if you want that behavior. So here you could write it this way. So um, one of the other things you see, it has this dot syntax, another dot, not okay, dot, you could just keep doing this. This is the concept of selecting a node descending, selecting a node, descending, selecting a node, descending, selecting a node, and then you finally do something with the last one, and in this case, you'd be rendering it, uh, or in this case, you'd be doing an if. But what if we were to do what works out to be a render within Django? So this is the Django code that I think Yorun wrote last night or the night before, and um, it just creates, at the end, he's gonna want this render, and then he has reverse iterators, and he just goes ahead and creates the select tree on up. So he's got all these nodes of selects that he keeps adding to each other. So select, context, select, context, select, context, and then he finally returns the body. So he's building that up to follow the dot notation. <coughs> all right. So we've got one of these. Now what do we do with it? Um, we've completed this part. We now need a generate. So generate is gonna take the compiled template and the user data and apply those in the engine and uh, we're gonna get our generated result. Um, generate takes a stream, the, uh, a node for the internal VM, and then a context. And the context is whatever data thing you pass in. And it calls generate. The detail generate looks like this. What a surprise. So detail generate is going to do nothing more than get a visitor and start visiting that. And what is it visiting? Well, it's visiting the template because the template is going to drive the behavior of what we need to do with the data set that we have, the context. So um, I put this diagram together hoping that it will help. <laughs> so on this side, we have um, the internal AST that we're, we're going to be walking. In this side, we have our context. This is going to represent a, um, a map in which we've got two string values and conference, in this case, is another map. And its name points to CPP now and its year to 2015. 
the name here points to Jeff. Make sense? All right. As I'm walking here and I hit this if condition, what I'm wanting to do is it will be if, and this is where my context pointer is, I'm going to have an if statement that's like if conference. So if I have a conference, however that evaluates to be true, then I want to do something. So if conference, then select context. Well, now I've selected a new context. So this was true and I selected in here. And so this is now like where the pointer inside of my AST is for the context of, of where I am. So I think what's, if you think about it like a stack that doesn't ever destroy, right? It's just a tree and you're moving the pointer around in the tree. That's basically what the context is. Um, if I did a select context on name, um, there's actually really nothing to select. So Jeff is, Jeff is an, actually an uninteresting data value. Thanks. You're welcome. Sorry about that, yeah. yeah. If it was an array, that might be interesting. If it was an object of some sort, anything that was a little more interesting than Jeff, than the value. No, I, I don't know how to say it. Um, then it would be, then, then that would, yeah, that would be interesting. So this idea of what's interesting and what's not interesting, we can start to put these things into categories of what's interesting and not interesting and, and how we're going to perform, perform behavior based upon categories of how we're performing behavior and under what, I hate to use the word context, under what situation we're performing that, that same behavior. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, what, is our, what does our visitor look like then for the engine? Mm, pretty easy. So here we're going to get a node list. What are we going to do with the node list? Well, it's a list of nodes, so we're going to iterate over the nodes and we're going to apply the visitor on them. And if we have a node, what are we going to do? Well, if we have a node, we're just going to apply the visitor on the node because I don't know what to do with the node yet. Nodes are variants. And, and so I've got to apply the visitor so I can figure out what in the world the node actually really is. Undefined, at the moment we do nothing, you probably would want to do something smart here. Literal, what are we going to do with a literal? Well, literal, we're going to render. We're going to call render on literals, giving it the stream and then the value of the literal. And then um, if we have render, we're going to uh, call render, giving it the stream and the context that we're in and the name of the thing that we've been asked to render. Okay, so um, this is a smart crowd. Why do I have the using in here? ADL. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I have, I have the using in here for ADL. Why do I have the using in here for ADL? So that's the technical reason. It's because you want to break everything. It's because I want to break everything. You know, so there seems to be this really love-hate relationship with ADL. I love it most of the time. Um, but I was at lunch with some people who really hated it the other day. <laughs> that table actually, come to think of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so. So we're going to abuse or use ADL a little bit later for our benefit because, you know, whatever we release, we're not going to be able to handle every data type that everybody has under every situation. And we need an extension mechanism. And so we're basically enabling an extension mechanism. All right. What does an if then else look like? Well, pretty easy, right? We're going to test whatever the condition is. If it's true, we're going to apply the visitor to the then side, and if it's false, then we're going to apply the visitor to the else side. What does a for each look like? Um, well, you'll find out, but we're going to do a for each, giving it um, what we have. We're going we're gonna to delay that for a little bit. We're going to talk about for each in a little bit. Well, we're going to talk about for each right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so for each is where we're, we're going to use this as our example to start looking at what's happening on the data model side. So, so far, visitation, you know, piece of cake, just need to figure out what you want it to do behaviorally, given the thing that you've got. Types are representing behaviors in essence, right? Actions that we want to perform. All right, so this is what our for each looks like. It's giving the stream, a node, and a context. And the very first thing that we're going to do with our for each is we're going to call for each. But it's a for each that's specialized on this category. 
So we're taking whatever the context type is that came in, and we're, we've created another field called category, and we're going to use that to help make some decisions along the way. What are categories? Well, at the moment, the ones that are described are, are when there's actually another, but there's a fusion one too, but <coughs> um, we have an unused, plain, container associative, tuple, variant, and optional. So these are um, the category types or the classifications that, that w at least so far that I have found interesting for data model types that have come in. I might find other things that are interesting later and that'll be fine because it won't break anything and I can change how I deal with that later. Yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, you have container and associative. Yes. And um, based on what I think you might have meant, I wonder why you didn't choose sequence and associative. Um, that would have been a much better choice. So the question, the, the comment is that um, instead of container and associative, probably should have picked sequence and associative. And, I, and I'm afraid if you look at the blame log, I probably wrote this. But no, if you I look at the time, I probably wrote it like at four in the morning last year at BlueCon. So I'm just wondering <laughs> if, if there was any no, no, additional there's meaning there. No additional meaning. In fact, okay. that's exactly what it means, the sequence. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so these are, these are the categories that we're going to deal with. But these by themselves aren't actually all entirely important. It's associated with something else. So you'll notice um, here, it was the for each category of this context. Because if I'm dealing with a for each, I actually may want to iterate over the tuple or the associative item or the, there's, that may suddenly look like something that I actually want to treat as a sequence. As opposed to, um, you know, it's not a sequence all the time. When, when I have a map and I'm trying to use it in an associative way, it needs to look associative. Mm -hmm. And so under the usage pattern, um, we're going to get different categories out and they may perform behavior based upon that. So uh, for each, what do we do? Plain attribute, I know is a really bad idea, but name, but that's what's called, plain attribute. Well, we're not going to do anything. <laughs> or excuse me, this is how we're going to get the, uh, this is how they're defined, these are, these are the traits. Um, a string at the moment is a plain attribute. I really don't want strings to look like sequences. Uh, optionals are optional. Um, at the moment, a map string to a T is going to be an associative. Uh, variant is, um, a variety of different things that could be variant, boost variant, extended variant, there are a couple other things that could be variant. Mm -hmm. Those are the variants. Um, this is a hack, but, um, but you just play with it for the moment. So uh, anything that actually I can call begin on that isn't a map <laughs> will be a container attribute. Okay, so that, or, or a sequence. So here's my for each with a category. Uh, the the non-specialized version just calls generate again. If you remember right, generate is the top. That's how we entered into this whole mess. So, what do I do? I just start at the beginning again and call myself right back down again, right? Because then I don't have to think about anything because I've already I'm just writing things in very small little visitation bits and pieces. Um, for each. If it is a variant, variants are interesting in the sense that I don't know what they are. So a variant is actually fairly useless to me and I need to unwrap the variant. In fact, every time I see a variant, I want to unwrap it and see what it is. So I apply a visitor to this variant, which is going to do nothing more than get the thing that's in it and call for each on it. And it's gonna call the top level for each so that it can trickle down and do all the logic that it needs to again. Um, all right, so what if we actually have an optional? Uh, I'll talk about it and then I'll tell you, this is, a good, this is a good slide to talk about this. So it's going to see whether or not it tests true and if so, then it's gonna dereference it and um, it is then going to call the for each on whatever was in the optional starting all over again, <coughs> right? Start, starting that whole process going down. So this is a good place to, to point out, this is, there's a lot of design here, but there's not a lot of implementation here. So I, I shouldn't be doing this. There should be calls 
that understand how to test whether an optional has something or not. And there should be a call that says how to get something out of an optional, how to dereference the optional. Because those become customation, customization points again for me that the user can say anything that they want it to be called an optional. I mean, it could just be a struct that has a bool in it and the actual value in it, right? They can make the determination of, of that. So um, while you see stuff like this here, <coughs> these should all be yet one more level removed so that they could all become customization points. <coughs> all right, and then finally we actually have a for each for something we can for each. And um, in this sense, we're going to iterate over it and we're going to call generate again, passing it then. Um, so this is the item that we have. This is the inside of, of the AST that we're walking. This is the engine's AST, the VM. So we've now entered into the next VM, we've gone into the section, right? And we're dealing with what's inside, inside there. All right. So, so that's one that's gonna, that's the mechanism that deals with, you know, however it can grab data and whatever it can do with it. Uh, how about now uh, the select context? We'll take a look at one more and then you can kind of see how this all works together. So select context is gonna call select context dispatch and it's going to actually use the select category of whatever the context is. How do I do selects on this thing? How do I how do I move down the pointer inside of my data ASD, my data side, point to the thing that I want. So select context dispatch um, for the generic catch-all just calls generate on the template body, so the, th the, the thing that it has already, and the context that it already has. So if I have if the thing that I have is a string, it doesn't make any sense to select that because there's nothing more I can do with it. There's, there's, it's not a node that I can go into, it's a leaf node basically. Think of it like that, right? It's like a leaf. I can't do anything else with this thing. Uh, if I've got one of those, I don't want to actually change my context. I want to keep the pointer where it is and just continue processing. Um, if the thing that I have is associative in the context that we're talking about, which is selecting things, then what I want to do is um, I need to figure out w what, if I was to dereference the thing, what it is I'm going to point to. So earlier, Jeff was pointing from the name. Conference had this really neat thing on the other side, right, that I, I would want to change my pointer to. And I want to change my pointer to, to Jeff, but I'd like to change my pointer to the conference object. Well, the only way to make that determination is I have to select the context on that second thing. I need to make the determination of, of what the thing is that I'll end up on, on whether it's interesting or not. And so um, I'm going to use the category of that thing in order to make the determination and call select context. If, if I don't actually have, if it's associative and I can't find the thing that I'm looking for, then, well, I just need to continue generating on because it doesn't exist. So select context. Um, the generic version of select context is just going to use the parent's context. It's not going to use the child context. That would be like the, uh, the name. But if the child is associative, then uh, this is an interesting thing. It looks like an object of some sort, something we can do something with. And so <coughs> we're going to actually want the child, so we're going to generate the stream against the child instead. So we've now switched down context. Now we've called generate at the, the top level generate again. So if you remember what the top level generate did is it created a new visitor and it passed in a new context. So when all this stuff falls apart and starts unwinding again, when I basically end that, I will automatically take care of popping my context and moving my pointers back to where I want them, right? So I don't have to think about managing any of that. It just, just works. Um, if it's a container, same type of thing. All right, what if it's a variant? What do I have to do? I find out what's in the variant. I find out what's in the variant. Yeah, the same thing I always do. Anytime I want to deal with something, I end up with a variant. <coughs> I've got to unwrap the variant and try to figure out how to continue on. So, um, as you can imagine, unwrap and then it calls select. So, we won't look at that. All right. So, 
we, we've looked at a few of these and that hopefully will give you an idea of without burying us in more code <laughs> of how how all of this kind of gets pieced together and and how we end up with being able to by by selecting categories under the condition they're being used create behavior that makes sense um, given a few more um, abstractions on how we deal with like variants and things of that sort you, you pull things out of associative maps you can start to see pretty quickly um, associative containers you can start to see pretty quickly that you can kind of almost throw anything at this right in fact remember the original structs that we had well, what if I just wrote a customization point for the associative lookup of that that did nothing more than I actually literally got the name name right I got I got a string name and I knew that that was I should return a reference to that thing inside of my struct as opposed to the fancy meta programming stuff right it just returns the field uh, so you know from a first level approximation we can customize anything given a lot of code I want to do that so the other thing works better um, all right so let's talk about customization points um, and at least what what works well now so we're going to print out library in a week subject topic is uh, if it's secret we're not telling and if it's not secret then we're going to give what the library in the week is so how do we determine whether the library in a week subject is is um, topic is secret or not how many of you've been here long like more than once you should know this does anybody ever know what the library in the week topic other than Marshall is going to be? Marshall doesn't know. <laughs> Marshall doesn't even know. John, I think, I'm maybe sure knows. Jeff Jeff. Jeff. The question is, when does Jeff know? Yeah. yeah Jeff. All I know is that everybody will know once the conference has started. But be, before that point, nobody knows. So it's a secret. Okay? Um, so if the conference has started, um, is what's going to determine whether or not secret returns true or false and what the name is going to be is this library in the week topic it's another method so what we're doing now is we're we're going to map strings to in this case some methods so the mechanism if you remember a category isn't callable in fact that's on purpose because it's not really sure what to do with that if it got something back does it just turn it back into the engine and try to work on it again or what, what should it do with it and kind of like at that point if you have functions that you're calling you need to do some customization so what would a customization look like for this how would I make it work because it doesn't know how to deal with functions well we have two things going on one we're, we need to be able to test things the second is we need to be able to render things those are the only customization points we care about at the moment so inside of the namespace of boost boostash extension we're going to create our test this is the signature it's going to get uh, this is really at the tag it's called name at the moment we're going to um, we're going to specialize on function of t a, f a function uh, <laughs> a function that returns something that takes nothing um, and um, here it's a plain attribute because at what has happened at this point through all of the trying to figure out what category this thing is for the testing of it or not it doesn't match any of the other categories and so it just kind of gets shoved off into this plain category and it's going to actually try to um, it's going to try to evaluate with bang 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 whatever this thing is and if it if that doesn't evaluate to something boolean-ish um, the compiler is going to complain right which is what would have happened and why we decided to write a customization point <clears throat> so what are we going to do well we're going to call test <laughs> because um, we want to use the mechanism that's already written I want to use the mechanism that's already written inside of the system I'm gonna call test again giving it the name and actually in this case calling the function that I got which I mean it's kind of <coughs> well the one that we gave it, it's boring because it returns a t-type right I mean a boolean but what if it returned a map or a list or something else some other big huge AST right I just shove it back in let all the stuff that I've already written just take care of it again 
how does render work? Well, I'm going to render whatever gets returned from this is what I want to do. So I'm going to call render again, call the context, and um, give it the name. So just shove it back into the system again. So there, there's my customization points to make functions work. All right. Um, so the things, where are we? Uh, it needs general cleanup. It needs a lot of cleanup. Uh, there's like, what's that? If, so <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'll say right now, it builds if you, if you use boost build, like the rest of boost, that the directory structure is somewhat fashioned after, it'll build fine. Um, Jeff is actually working on getting the CMake stuff to work, and maybe it's close or has part of it working, or oh, for a head yeah, nod. Actually. actually has it working. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what, I mean, what happened basically over the last years, I don't use CMake. And so, um, yeah. So <laughs> I hear directory structures don't even exist that it references. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried building it. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> With boost build? Like, regardless. Of Oh, yeah. Build's fine. <laughs> Are you on develop? Oh. Are you on developer or master? Master. I don't know if master builds or not. So, two things. One, I don't know if master builds or not. Two, I am certain there's something wrong with the Boost 158 release. I think it has to do with extended variant, but I'm not positive. There's something, something messed up with that. So, I'm, on, I'm running on um, uh, develop for, I'm running either master or develop for most libraries. It's directly out of the boost repo. So if you're on 158, I don't know. I'll, I'll try again. And I heard somebody said that they ran it with 158. Did you run it with 158 and GCC 5.0, 5.1? Uh, yeah, like, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if my results are reproducible. So the, it, should, it should build and work and run. <laughs> That's what I, um, for, Okay, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> so, uh, so the, um, the Kira build server is building it, and it says that one, one thing is failing. It's building it on Clang and GCC both. And those, are, those results are published. Those are, the, those are the results that when it says failed inside the test mat matrix, that's where that's coming from. Um, and if you go look, which you can, at the bamboo server, it will show you what's failing. It's one test that should actually be failing because the feature is not actually implemented yet for <coughs> mustache. Okay, so we need to complete the mustache and Django support. Um, and then we need to complete the generalization of the category handling. That's the thing that I was just talking about where I don't just treat optionals like you can dereference them, actually call something so they can be specialized later. Um, and then the whole extension mechanism really needs to be thought out better. It's, um, it's clanky at best. Uh, it, it can be extended, which just gave me confidence that it means that the mechanisms behind the scenes really work, and now we can work on a better <coughs> interface for that. Um, and it needs docs, lots of docs, and more docs, and some more docs. Um, this is where you can find it. It is in the Kira Labs Boostash um, repository. And um, Secure Labs is a group that, of our company that does open source projects and supports open source projects. And um, so the, the intent is once it goes in there, it's supposed to be supported. So it's like the put it there and it'll happen. <laughs> so we uploaded the YAML parser there so that we could finally get some support. So if you file some bugs against the YAML parser, Joel can fix them. <laughs> um, okay, we have we have ten minutes left. Yeah, we can do some questions, and I've got I've got the bonus slides. So we can, yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so okay, yeah, I forgot this. I should have made this disclaimer like several times throughout the presentation. This is not a Boost library. Boost Stash, which is not a Boost library. <laughs> Just keep thinking that Boost Stash, which is not a Boost library. Um, I don't know. So so this is this is the question: is whether or not it's actually interesting t as a boost library uh, I, and I I don't know so my my intent is to continue developing and finishing it as if it is a boost library to see if there's interest in it and then if so then maybe really 
you know, brush up the stuff the, the rest of the way. Because um, I, I don't know that I want to, I don't know that I want that input yet. So the question was, should I take a poll? I, I will take a poll. I'll take a poll of this room? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> this room's great. <laughs> I mean, is this, is this an interesting library to anybody? Oh, okay. <laughs> there, there are a couple. The guy who wrote all the tests initially, <laughs> things like, yeah, not so interesting. <laughs> but you had fun with library in a week, didn't you? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it was included in Boost and using Boost Build, it would actually build when I tried to build it. I told somebody that today, too, who told me they were trying to CMake build. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying that if basically anything I've ever seen that try to use boost build out and depend on boost while not being part of boost just is extremely difficult to work with. Oh, we should talk later. It's, we use it completely. Any other questions? Yeah. I think you should add it to the incubator. To That's a possibility. Yeah, so um, the suggestion is to submit to the incubator. Um, maybe once, right now it would not get to go into the incubator. It doesn't have any docs. So. <laughs> but when it gets to that point, Good suggestion. Yeah. Well, this is more of a comment <clears throat> than a question. Um, I think it should be a boost library for sure, um, in part because, in my experience, this business of text processing comes up just constantly. And having a facility to do this um, is really nice. And this design, I guarantee you, there is no other templating engine that's designed like this one, okay? Because every single other one of them, I think we looked at, right? It was you got to put it in a map of maps. You got to do all these transformations of your data model. This is the only one that has any idea of being able to bind itself up against whatever data model you already had. And I, I think it's I think it's very unique for extracting just like status of a program. When it's running for getting things out, it's very flexible. Anything, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I suggested a uh, a topic for next year to Jeff, but now I'm thinking that this could it could be done fairly easily here, <coughs> which was a publishing solution for people who have code that they wish to include in presentations, so that they compile them and test them and merge it into their presentation, change the code and merge it again. I, I believe my response to you was that it sounds like a hack. With boost and some, mm -hmm. you know, but, labeling you know, and whatever. Eric would say the right answer there is to take a screenshot of your your editor, your your IDE, and paste that. So then you're not tempted to change the code on the fly. Yeah. I was thinking that Eric is smart, <laughs> no, a wise man. Like that. <laughs> so you know the performance benefit of not having to transform your model into some other thing mm -hmm. is maybe not a minor deal for some people. And in addition to that. The idea that, yeah, we can have as many front ends as we want to have because, you know, I already got some legacy code that I wrote in Python mm. and now I want to use a C++ application on it. Um, you know, again, I, I think the design is, is uh, really unique and I, I think it speaks volumes about the participants in Library in a Week last year, you know, working through that design and coming to the point and I guess you care really carrying the ball. So, thank you. So the, the general comment is um, it should go into being submitted at least as a boost library. <laughs> All right. Bonus slides. What's that? Bonus slides. Bonus slides. Okay. So um, here are the bonus slides. It's actually the right group for the bonus slides too. So, <laughs> um, so uh, Zhu Hao last night actually kind of touched on this in his lightning talk, um, which was interesting, on how you do this type of thing. So you have... The problem is I have a string that came in and I need to actually look this up based upon a compile time value. Need to, I've got this dynamic string thing and now I'm trying to figure out which, um, which string this matches, the name matches with the struct that I've, I've um, adapted. So I adapt a struct and it has inside of it fields name, city, state, um, name, city, and state end up being actually strings that I could somehow get to if I could figure out how to um, work through this structure, right? This, mm -hmm. this fusion adapted structure and do something with it. And, and so 
Um, we're going to look at two, two things at the moment. We're going to look at, because they're easy to get through, how do you do it for testing whether or not the thing is there or not? If you had a fusion adapted struct like we had early on and we wanted to say, um, in essence, if this thing, true or false, right, Boolean of this thing, well, what does that mean? That means that I'm trying to treat a struct as if it's an associative container and look up by its name, get whatever is on the other side, and then evaluate that for its falsiness, right? That's, that's what I'm trying to do. So the first, um, the first part of that step is testing whether it's there or not. And so we're, we're gonna write two things. One is um, we're going to write a method that's going to return the tags index. So the tag being the thing that got passed in, the name. Trying to get its index out. The other thing is we're just gonna test whether or not it has a tag. Well, it ends up that actually if the index is greater than or equal to zero, it had the tag. So um, has tag is just if the tag index is greater than or equal to zero. So we, we're not gonna write a meta program for that. We're just gonna write one for this, which is uh, trying to get the tag index out. And how we're going to do that is we're gonna pass in, uh, we're, going to, um, we're gonna create one of these with the sequence. This is, the fusion, this, is, this is a fusion adapted thing, so your struct type. And um, we are going to ask for this thing, how many fields did it have? So this is one of the extension things for Fusion when we adapted it. We can do this, we can give it our type, and we can get value from this. And that tells me like three fields. So I'm gonna take that, subtract one, and then away I'm gonna go, because I need index values. That's what I wanna deal with. Um, all right, here's the struct. And um, it has a call. The call is taking and it is looking up the member name inside of the data type for whatever I I am on. So this is going to get back out a const char star. And it's going to compare that to the tag I passed in. If they're equal, then I'm going to return whatever I I am on, the index value. Else, I'm going to go ahead and instantiate another one of these with <coughs> i minus one and, um, and recurse down again, right? Just do it again. Um, and then, of course, I, I need my zero, so I stop. <laughs> and so if it's the zero, one, zero, and then I just made a special number because that's what I like to do, and I return negative one if it just couldn't find it, and then that's how I can take care of there or not there without having to write another meta program. So, that will easily get back out my tag index, which index that name represents. Yes, question? Why did, why did you write the full for, for the zero tag? It would have been enough to, to just uh, implement it for minus one and return minus one. Um, the question is, um, should I, couldn't I have just implemented the minus one version? Yeah. The answer is yes. Um, so the reason was, Initially, there was a um, there was also a meta program that calculated whether or not it had it, and so it, this one stopped at zero because it didn't make sense to go further, and um, yeah, so it should have been reworked. Good, good find. So, what does render look like? Um, similar type thing. We're going to instantiate this render tag, giving it the 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 um, struct that we have, and again, extracting the size, calling call, giving it an actual reference to this, the struct, and then the tag. And um, this looks the same. So it's gonna keep looking for it until it finds it, and once it finds the one that it's looking for, it's gonna call render. If it didn't find it, it's going to decrement and reinstantiate another one. Um, and then, of course, when we get to zero, we're, we either got it or we don't, and we stop. Um, so what does render look like? Um, this is to, these are this is all slightly different than the real implementation in order to make it easy to see on the screen, so we're just gonna see out things. Render looks like um, accessing the struct, given uh, the type and the index that we want, and uh, once we have this type out, then inside, inside of that there is another struct that is parameterized, and so uh, template apply on the type, 
calling with S, and this will get back out a reference to the actual member that we want. So now we have a reference to that member, and we can go ahead and send that out. So th this is the, the basic mechanism for testing and saving. Um, as you can imagine, it's then what would happen is if you were trying to do a select, all it does is it, it now has the thing it wanted to do the select on, and it can shove that back into the mechanism for the, th the rest of the engine runs on, and then the rest of the engine just kicks in and does what it's supposed to for data types, right? Um, which, if it happens to be another adapted type, we'll go through this whole process again, trying to figure out what to do with it. So, all right. Any other questions? Oh, we hit our time perfectly. Thank you very much. <laughs>